Welcome to Define, the podcast making the most important projects in crypto easy to understand and accessible to all. This week, we speak to Paladin, a project who provides markets for influence and voting rights across DeFi. Do you want to just start off by introducing yourself? So my name is Romain. I'm one of the founders of Paladin. Paladin is a um, governance management protocol and ecosystem in DeFi. Today, especially on Ethereum. Uh, before being into crypto, uh, I used to be a banking lawyer, but uh, I've been building Paladin for the better part of uh, the last two years. And uh, yeah, that's the very brief intro to myself. What made you decide to move on from banking lawyer stuff? Oh, well, I always was in crypto. I've been in crypto around like for the past six to seven years. You know, buying tokens, looking at what was happening. And at some point I met the guys who were building Maker and Aave. And uh, they were talking about something new that was being created that was called DeFi. That was like early 2019. And they kind of melted my brain because I used to work a lot around finance. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense what they're building. Maybe I should try something, helping them or building something in that in that uh, that way. So I started getting very interested around what was happening. I started testing things out. And uh, at some point during a hackathon, we introduced the idea of vote lending on Aave. That was during um, a market make, I think, during ETH Global in January 2021. And we ended up uh, being one of the winners of the hackathon. So nice. when that happened, we're like, okay, maybe we should try and turn this into a full blown pro- protocol. <laughs> And then the rest is history. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really interesting. I guess you had quite a few transferable skills from before to moving over into actually creating Paladin and stuff. Nah, man, I'm 27. I was 25 <laughs> at the point. Like, I had no skills. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, all in all, I think that the lawyers in general have a very strong advantage in crypto mm-hmm. because the whole basis of finance is actually contracts. Anything in finance is actually based on contracts. And what's interesting is that in crypto, uh, at least in DeFi, we don't have contracts. So we're replacing all of this by code. But the base architecture, the way all of this is engineered, is basically the same logic that's used in banking law. So basically, the people who understand how to structure all of this, they're financial lawyers. Yeah. So there's a huge uh, number of skills that can be ported from law to crypto. So right now I gave the example of finance, but the simple fact that crypto is a way to uh, disintermediate trust and to transform it into algorithms means that you're basically using what you've been taught, like the rhetoric and the logic that you're taught in law, and you're basically putting it to code. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that's, I think that's what I meant from the transferable skills, obviously, uh, the fact that there are so many similarities between what you did before and, and now what you're doing. The, the kind of parallels are really interesting, I think. So now that you, you know, now that you're fully into Paladin, what is your role within the project? Oh, so I tend to say I do everything that the other people in the core team don't do. Uh, and the more time passes, the less and less things I'm supposed to do, like in terms of a specific number of things. But uh, mainly, uh, my co-founder does all of the technical parts, so he's uh, more of the engineer. I started doing the architecture of the project with him. Then I've been doing a lot of business development, fundraising when we needed to at the beginning, uh, communications and marketing, but they have people helping me too on that front. So I would say today it's a lot of BD, a lot of community and governance. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind, then, if you were at a dinner party and you're speaking to someone who is fairly new to crypto, maybe with like a, a basic working knowledge of the space, but not really that in depth, how would you explain Paladin in fairly simple terms? So I like to define it with a mission in the sense that I tell people we try to democratize activism. That's the grand scale of things, because I think that one of the specificities of Paladin is that it's not, a, not just a DeFi specific product. In the sense, we're experimenting a lot around governance and uh, what looks like corporate governance. And we think there's a strong use case for us to uh, use everything we've learned in a few years and basically replicate it in the public markets. Maybe even simpler? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so we're trying to enable more people to participate into governance. So reducing the barriers of entry mm-hmm. by... Uh, raising the 
the capacity for people to access to influence in crypto in general. So could you go into a little bit more detail about there's two different elements, right? Paladin and Warden? Yeah. So in a sense, uh, uh, Warden is like a V2 of Paladin uh, on a different token model. So what happened is that we started doing Paladin, what we call Paladin Lending today, our first app that was released 10 months ago. Uh, we released it for Aave, for Uni, for Compa, and we realized that the uh, governance was not as uh, uh, active as we thought, so it would be complicated for us to keep leveraging this. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, Curve has been running, Curve Finance has been running a lot more to prominence, has been much more active in terms of governance participation, but because they had a very different tokenomics, uh, so a model of uh, token uh, architecture, we had to recreate another application to basically be compatible with Curve. So this is Warden. Warden is very basically a port of the logic that we built for Paladin, but specialized for the Curve ecosystem. Would you be able to, I mean, obviously we all know about how uh, influential and important Curve has become, but if you could maybe explain that a little bit in a bit more detail? Yeah, so Curve is a very interesting protocol because it's one of the biggest uh, decentralized exchanges. Uh, it's on uh, almost all of the chains possible uh, to actually have an AMM on. And uh, what's really interesting is that uh, they're a bit harder to use than Uniswap, which is the, the biggest one. But uh, what they did is that they have a very smart tokenomics model that enables the stakeholders to better stay alive. So what's interesting, yeah, is that if you look at the model, uh, most of the people who are actually active inside of Curve, they basically lock their tokens for four years. So even I thought we had like one of the biggest crashes of crypto, like for the past three months, no one can do anything. I mean, I have BCRB that's locked. It's like I can just look at it and say, okay, that's <laughs> awesome. And it's pretty crazy because it did not affect uh, the yield that may be in admin fees, so the actual fees the protocol is making, or in terms of uh, APY that the people are actually uh, pay, uh, earning by, uh, by taking bribes today to actually participate into the gateway uh, votes. So in a sense, Curve is a very smart DEX because it started being specialized for stable coins when people didn't think it would be that big. And then it's been, it's been scaling. So I don't know up to where Curve will go, but I do see it as one of the most resilient building block in crypto because uh, most of its parts are immutable. In your opinion then, I know you just referenced <laughs> the crash and everything and the, the issues that we're currently having in the ecosystem. In your opinion, what else is sort of broken in today's world, be that in TradFi, DeFi, just things that you want to fix? Well, there's so many things broken. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty big question. Maybe I should narrow it down. No, 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 I think, no let's go for it. Yeah, yeah. I think we should go for it because, to be honest, uh, we're not enough ambitious in crypto. Uh, the way I see crypto, it's a way to replace part of the trust chain we have in society by algorithms. It doesn't mean we should replace everything by algorithms. I think that's kind of dystopian. But there are small parts we can replace to become more efficient to create, uh, to remove the need of trust in some places and to basically remove um, the uh, accumulation of wealth that some intermediaries can do. So it's a way for us to uh, create, I wouldn't say more equal society, but something at least a bit less ugly in a sense. And uh, maybe we're not being ambitious enough on what we're trying to build in crypto. So what we want to build at Paladin is uh, we, can't, we want to create a wave of people who when they are not happy with the way things are, especially around corporate governance, they can basically express themselves, saying, no, I do not agree. I have, I, I have a way which is starting to easily find that a lot of people don't agree with me and then to push for the support to actually change things from inside. So in a sense, it's to enable more people to express their voices mm -hmm. inside of the, all of these boardrooms. And there is a real chance this could happen. It's, uh, people are talking a bit about this and they call this stakeholder capitalism as the next step of uh, the world economy in which we are in, because uh, in a sense, uh, almost every company, you can now buy equity into it. So you can become a shareholder in, in these companies. And once you're a shareholder, you basically have fiduciary rights that enable you to voice your opinion and to try to push for change inside of these companies. So when people say, oh, I don't agree with uh, Facebook or Google's uh, advertisement policy, sure, but you can become a shareholder and push for change from the inside. And almost no one is doing that today. It's like, yes, some very, very rich folks are doing that. 
for example, Elon Musk, but so many other people that <laughs> could do it. You don't, you don't need to be Elon Musk to do activism. No, no, I like that. I think that you're right in that a lot of the people that do end up doing the shareholder, buying the shares and stuff, are possibly the people... It's better to have many, many people who share a view than one person with a massive stake. And I think that's probably a problem that you guys are looking to solve. So you said that perhaps we're not dreaming big enough. We're not we're not kind of going for big enough ideas. If you could go for one kind of, you know, really crazy out there, we're going to change the world with this idea and know that it wouldn't fail, what would you be pushing for? Oh, the one we're doing. That's what I, when I, when, yeah, when I'm telling democratizing activism, our, our, our dream at Paladin is simply that uh, someone not being happy with, like, with the policy their, their flower maker is, is imposing <laughs> on them could simply say, no, I don't agree. Like talking about it in forums, realizing that there's hundreds and hundreds of bakeries that don't agree, don't agree with them. And who all happen to be shareholder of the same agro industrial company and just come in and basically take a seat in the board and change things. And to be honest, more than just doing it, it has to be enabled durable change to acquire, to enable more stakeholders to express themselves, but also to create something that can evolve with context, which means movements should be more ephemeral than they are today. Like we're going to go even broader, but if you look in democracies, so in, polit- in the political world, uh, much, mo- uh, most uh, political parties are actually several decades, if not several uh, centuries old, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. But the truth is that there is no way the same political party uh, stay, it doesn't stay the same during these centuries, even during the decades, it keeps evolving. So I think that in all instances of governances, but we see it more in politics, we tend to have a vision of a lot of rigidity, but the truth is that it's very ephemeral. Like mm. political parties or governance movements and or uh, factions basically appear for a certain reason. And then in theory, they should disappear. They don't have any legitimate reason to stay as big as they are. The only reason they do is that because people want to keep the power and the, uh, and the wealth attraction that they're taking for themselves. So what have been some of your challenges in getting Paladin to the place that it is now? And how have you managed to overcome them? Mm, that's a good question. Why is crypto? There's a lot of challenges, to be honest. Uh, uh, one of the, the, I would say, the most basic one that people underestimate a lot it's simply the fact that you're building open source. So uh, whatever your idea may be, you can't just read something and then go on to someone else because mm. someone is just going to look at your code and say, oh, that's a cool idea. It's successful. I should build it too. So And they can just copy the code. So you have much less of a moat than you can have in other industries. And on top of that, um, everything is immutable. So once you deploy something on mainnet, especially on Ethereum, the code is there. It's going to be a lot, very hard to change. The problem is that a lot, it's a lot that uh, is not widely talked about. On, that perfect code doesn't exist. So when you release something, there's bound to be bugs, yeah. and uh, that means that uh, if people push tens or hundreds or billions of dollars from the get-go inside of your protocol, you didn't even have time to battle test it. So you're going to have to keep fixing as the boat is already floating on water, <laughs> yeah. which is kind of dangerous. We've been fortunate to have a uh, moderated growth, which has helped us build and uh, be very sure that everything was working correctly. But there's a lot of partners who we keep working with, and we realize that they are in this situation where they have to build the boat as they are actually uh, sailing, right? Mm. And it's not a bad thing. It's just the way crypto works because you're building immutable protocol uh, contracts. And it's extremely exp- uh, expensive in terms of communication instead of human resources, instead of financial resources to rebuild a second version and to ask everyone to migrate the liquidity. Yeah, yeah, Liquidity migration is extremely expensive. So you cannot just release a second version. You have to keep evolving your product, which creates a lot of technical debt for a lot of projects. And that's something that a lot of people have criticized Maker for. They have created an extremely resilient protocol, but they're paying a lot in Oracle fees, for example, because the tech is four years old now. But that's the price of building into crypto. So yeah. you have to build with all of this in mind and uh, also in the fact that uh, it's calmed down a bit, but we were in a very exuberant market. So nothing was rational. You could just basically say you had uh, met uh, a very important person uh, and, uh, and take a picture with him and you would basically skyrocket your valuation. <laughs> in no sense. 
<laughs> and uh, and now even if you release like the biggest step uh, of uh, the life cycle of your protocol, it's not good. I'm going to change the valuation. Like people just don't care. So it's a lot more irrational than traditional companies. Which I guess is kind of a pro and a con. The fact that you have to keep building the boat as as it's setting off is is probably what drives the uh, industry to be so kind of iterative and, and fast growing and stuff. But then also I can see how a little bit more time to battle test stuff would be a, a bit of a dream. So what sort of things are you excited about moving forward? So I know at the minute, obviously, the industry is a little bit, a little bit strained, but things are going to improve very soon, hopefully. And so what other than that are you excited uh, what's the future of Paladin? What are the next things that you're excited about happening? Oh, there's so many things, to be honest, uh, around Paladin, but even in crypto in general. The truth is that even though the market is not doing well, like all of the protocols are building and are releasing a lot of very, very cool things. Uh, for example, State, State DAO's liquid locker, they're a really cool innovation. But uh, we're very excited about meta governance in general. Uh, it's always been a topic that we've been... Uh, super inclined to work around. There's not that many people who are on meta governance, but everyone keeps being bullish on it. I think the, the, the simple truth is that we failed to harness and create value out of meta governance until today. And that's probably because you, uh, because of a uh, lack of UX, I think. It's, uh, we, we want to put the concept of meta governance in the face of people, but uh, people don't really care about governance when it's simple. So if you put it in an even broader and more complicated term, it, it will work even less. <laughs> yeah. So what? how are you going to grab him? How are you going to really get him involved? So I'm not going to leak too much because this is still a work in progress for us. Uh, but uh, there's multiple ways we're going to tackle the meta governance concept. First, we just released a Paladin tool for the index token. So index is the governance token of index co-op. What's interesting is that index co-op is uh, they basically build an ETF for crypto or multiple ones. And their biggest one is an ETF for DeFi, in which they have a lot of the blue chip projects, probably all of them. So they have Wi-Fi, they have uh, Aave, Comp, Maker, all of these guys are inside of this uh, index. And uh, uh, the index is called the DPI, DeFi Pulse Index. And what they did is that they took away the governance power. And it's basically the holders of the index, so their governance token, that's basically managing the governance power of the people that were underlying of the ETF. So I hope I'm being uh, clear enough <laughs> with this because it can get very complicated very quickly. But what's interesting is that they basically have proposal power for most of these protocols. So it costs dozens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to be able to create or, or pass the proposals in the biggest projects in crypto. Uh, with Index, we're basically creating a leveraged way to access governance uh, on these big protocols like Aave, for example. Mm -hmm. So we're basically, if our vote lending techniques are a way to get leverage on your governance power, you're basically getting leverage on the leveraged uh, token by itself. So it's like a square, you basically squared your, your leverage on governance. And the truth is that if it costs maybe uh, one Aave token, is maybe today it should be $60, and you need, I think, uh, 100,000 Aave or something like that to basically just uh, pass the quorum for a proposal. Mm. Uh, while with the index, they basically have 90,000 Aave, and you would need a uh, quorum on index to basically uh, move and decide with this 90,000 Aave. So this, they're like 12 times cheaper than index. So you're already paying 12 times cheaper to basically access to that. And then if instead of just buying that, you're borrowing their voting power, you're maybe going to pay 10 times cheaper. So you're basically accessing the same governance power for 120 times cheaper in period. That was, that was really well explained, actually. What, in your opinion, gives governance tokens their value? What makes them so important and crucial to the crypto ecosystem? There's been a very big debate that we've been seeing, especially on crypto Twitter, about the fact that governance tokens are useless and that we've been wrong, that we should have never done governance token. So this happened in 2018 too. When there's a crash, people are like, oh, wow, we should have never re re uh, released any, gov uh, any tokens. Uh, that was a very bad idea. And then uh, for two years, no one talked about tokens anymore. You could build in crypto, but releasing a token was very, very badly seen. And the person who broke the emerita was Curve Finance, actually. When they released their token, and most of the people actually delete their reactions to that, but uh, 
if you were there at that point and you can't really find them anymore, uh, a lot of big uh, tweet, crypto Twitter players were saying, oh, look, that's a very scammy behavior. Remember what happened in 2018 and 2017 when people did that with the ICOs. And uh, as time passed and as DeFi summer came, uh, we forgot about all of this. We're like, yeah, any token is good. So a lot of new scams reappeared. And now we're seeing again, because it's the end of the cycle, people saying, oh, governance tokens are worthless. But that's not true. Uh, the truth is that uh, today, when you're building a DeFi protocol, you have two options. Zero governance, so full immutability. It's what Liquidity has been trying to do. Or you're going to have to admit that at some point, you're going to need to upgrade your protocol. Or that part of the value of your protocol is going to come from coordination of the various stakeholders. And this coordination has to come from a certain governance mechanism. Because governance is simply a decision-making structure, right? So if you need something upgradable and decentralized, you need decentralized governance. There is simply no way around it. So what people are telling you is that instead of having a, a governance token, maybe you should have NFTs. Sure, but what's going to be the difference with a token? Like an NFT is just like a different type of token. Uh, they can tell you, okay, but we're only going to give it to certain type of contributors who do something. Okay, you can do that too. But the problem is that if you do so, you're removing almost any capacity for your project to actually have a fundraising mechanism because no one's going to want to invest into something if you don't give them something in return. And if you can't give them governance power, what are you going to give them? Dividends, right? How many protocols are actually making money today in crypto? Maybe 50? Halving is one of them. I know StakeDAO is one too, but there's very, very few of them. And we've, we've basically been working full-time on Palin for 14 months um, we've been live for 10 months and we are only profitable this month. It's the first month yeah, we are. Yeah. We, now it's going to last because Quest is a very sustainable business and we have clients like in our pipe and we know it's going to keep running. So we're not worried, but it takes time and it's very hard to achieve. So if you're promising to people dividend rights instead of governance power and that you're separating governance from dividends, a lot less people are going to participate in governance and there's already quite a few, not that many. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people who are trying to raise will simply never be able to raise because a lot of uh, normal investors will realize that there is no way this project is going to make revenue. So it's a more potentially a more uh, interesting approach, but the truth is that it's going to kill 95% of the market if we do so. And there's something else that we haven't mentioned on top of that, and then I will end my rant. <laughs> uh, the truth is that the biggest and most lucrative protocol, so just to give Aave, Wi-Fi maker. So the guys who are making a lot of money, millions and millions. And that's good. It's proof that DeFi is working, right? They already have a very distributed stakeholder base through the token. So they cannot go back. They can build on it, but they have some cost in terms of they cannot just say, okay, we're going to discontinue the governance token and we're going to do something else. The truth is that the biggest project in crypto are using governance token. So there's probably a new model that's going to appear, and I can't wait to see what's, what it's going to be. And we at Palin will follow this uh, movement and we'll try to build for it. But the truth is that today, governance tokens is a de facto model. Yeah. And I think that's something very important to understand. And that's why I'm very happy when I see what StakeDAO is doing with the liquid lockers, what we're able to, re to release today, what people are trying to do when they're trying to adapt the V tokenomics to their own project. It's a proof that people want to evolve, but they also acknowledge that there's some kind of sunk cost that we have to be careful on today. Yeah. And if new projects don't want to release a governance token, they shouldn't. But the truth is that they're here to stay. Yeah, it's a tried and tested method, isn't it? It's building on, building on some strong foundations, which I think is what a lot of people are doing at the moment. Yeah, well, it, it goes even further than that. You know, uh, in in DeFi and even crypto in general, we tend to have the hubris to think that we'll be inventing a lot of things. But the truth is that, especially on governance and coordination, we have uh, millennials and mill uh, thousands and thousands of years of experience, right? Mm -hmm. Of trials and errors. And uh, I think it's a shame that we don't look into history books and try to dig deeper where certain things haven't been done or where certain things have been discontinued. Is that simply they were not compatible with human behavior or with specific system that we had around. And there's probably a lot of things we are doing or that we try to do that would s simply don't work and simply are not logical. And right now, uh, the concept of money is probably the most efficient coordination we have, coordination tool we have as a society. And the concept of shares or as governance tokens, because the, the both concepts are very similar, right? 
governance tokens are the equivalent of shares in crypto, supercharged because you can actually program utility on top, mm. which is very smart. But it's the best way to coordinate capital around ventures. I think that's, and we, we, we might invent something more efficient, but we haven't. It's hard to think of how it could be more efficient. I was trying to think of an example of, can you think of anything from the current model which could possibly be improved? Yes, uh, reward more the contributors and less the investors, in a sense. That's, yeah. that's, that's, what is being, uh, that's what people are trying to, to look for in crypto today, and especially around the rethinking governance token and DeFi. The problem with that is that most projects actually need capital to begin with, and uh, almost no one wants to invest, uh, well, almost no one used to want to invest in risky ventures uh, because they had no promise of actually working. But because some of them worked so well in the last, last past years, everyone has been rushing to uh, to start up uh, financing, right? Yeah. But that's probably going to move away again, right? Because it's not a lucrative opportunity. A lot of people are going to lose a lot of money in that. I guess we just have to keep keep trying, keep seeing uh, the next way to do things, right? Yeah, it's, as long as you keep building, you keep building like uh, you have the right drive and you keep making revenue, there is nothing that's going to stop you. Even even if your token goes to one cent, it does not matter if you keep making revenue, keep churning out tech, because at some point the fundamentals will catch back with the truth of the market. Do you want to talk a little bit more about, um, and you mentioned Quest then. Um, I don't know if we've spoken in too much depth about it so far. Is there anything... No, it's true, we haven't. So Quest, uh, it's the latest iteration of uh, our DAP. When we mentioned we had Paladin and Warden, Warden is our second DAP for, uh, for of Paladin, uh, for both lending. It basically has two functions. The first one is a boost marketplace. And the second one, which we call Quest, is a gaze acquisition marketplace. So let's just uh, unwrap a bit. When you are in Curve Finance, you have the governance token that is called CRV. Mm -hmm. This governance token is useless. It's just a speculative asset. What you have to do is you have to, you have to lock it for up to four years to actually gain utility from, utility from that governance token. And once you lock it for four years, you gain four different utilities, which is a lot. Like There's very few tokens that are as generous. The first one is that you gain uh, what we call governance control, like every governance uh, token. So what you're able to do with this is basically control the parameters of the protocol. So basically vote with the others on how the parameters are going to be uh, tweaked. That's the first thing. The second one is you get the admin fees. They're shared between all of the VCRP holders. And the admin fees is basically all of the fees Curve Finance is making. Because what's very interesting is that Curve is actually not making any money. They're constantly re uh, redistributing everything which is why it's some kind of immutable public good, we could say. This, the third thing, on top of the admin fees and the parameters, is that basically curve tokens aren't fully distributed. There's an emission schedule for something like the next 300 years. And basically, every year, the emissions are reduced by 15 or 16%. And what happens is that every week, there's 4.3 million CRV tokens that are distributed right now. And people who control VCRV control to which pairs in the protocol, liquidity pairs, the CRV tokens are going to go. So what happens is that you're basically controlling the inflation of the token through this gateway. And that's everything that you hear about the curve wars come from these gateway ports. And that's what curve enables you to access. Uh, with Quest, we enable people to uh, buy votes to get the emissions. Because up until a certain price, it is interesting to buy these votes because it's going to be more interesting than actually creating a, your own liquidity mining program or that actually directly buying CRV. It's cheaper to buy the vote. And the third, a fourth thing is the boost. So now what happens is that the distribution that's made in emission is done to the people who are providing liquidity into Curve. So the way it happens is that the more underlying VCRV you have, the more providing liquidity is going to bring you money. So you have a minimum uh, APY and a maximum APY. And using something like Quest, uh, sorry, like Warden, like Convex, or like StakeDAO enables you to rise to, to raise the APY that you could have by farming on Curve indirectly. So that's something that's very that's very important. And that's what our boost marketplace is used for. So 
what we're trying to do on Pardon is basically with uh, with our golden app is creating a full stack application that's going to enable anyone who has VCRV or who uses the Curve ecosystem to basically understand all of their yield opportunities on Curve and to choose the one who are our core infrastructure on which we take feeds. So for example, today, uh, we don't have only our own interface. If you go on StakeDAO's uh, Bright Marketplace, it's uh, we basically partner with them and we basically fee, uh, share the fees uh, with the infrastructure we build and their interface for the SDCRG holders. And that's basically everything we've been trying in the Curve ecosystem is a way to basically re-empower the holders by getting give, giving them more control of their revenue opportunities. Yeah, that's really good. I do have a few kind of bonus questions. What's the history behind the name Paladin? Anything uh, uh, exciting there? So it's not really exciting per se. Uh, when we released that, we, reali we realized that the uh, boat landing, uh, which is the first step of what we're trying to build, uh, would could kind of be controversial. And that's willingly like you. You want the people to hear and discuss about your protocol, right? So I think it was a good, a good choice to start with this. Uh, and when we started with this, we said, okay, but uh, we're really trying to build with uh, ethics. We really want to focus around governance, around enabling more people to participate. So we have to show that we're here to protect the people. We're here to heal a system of governance that's clearly not, not working. In crypto, there's very low participation turnout. So like, well, a lot of people are around crypto play MMO. Like, like crypto is like, it's the great online game, right? Yeah. So if you play a big MMO, who are you going to try to have, to have in your team to protect you? It's going to be a paladin. That's where the paladin comes from. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. It was a pleasure. And... Yeah, I believe I believe we can leave it there. Well, thank you guys. It was a it was a lovely chat. I hope you'll have a nice end of day, and I will jump to keep working there. See you later, mate. <laughs>